This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Elmert met in Jerusalem for the second time this month. They plan to nail down an agreement of principles ahead of the upcoming November International Summit on Middle East Peace, which was called for by Bush. Abbas said that he will discuss with the Israelis the issues of the crossing points, the refugees and the security agencies. Al Jazeera has obtained a document that was submitted to the Palestinian Authority, claiming to be Israel's terms for the agreement of principles. These terms are being studied in private by teams from both sides. The document proposes a two-state solution, one for the Jews and another one without a military for the Palestinians. The borders defining these two states will be based on the borders of June 4, 1967. Israel will withdraw from what it calls significant areas. The document says nothing about the Palestinian refugees and their right of return. There is a great deal of talks about an agreement of principles that the Palestinians and the Israelis can reach before the upcoming international summit on Middle East peace, which was called by President Bush. The borders of the future Palestinian state, the division of Jerusalem, and the right of return of Palestinian refugees are the biggest obstacles. The Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert are continuously meeting in private to discuss the terms of an agreement of principles. Al Jazeera has obtained a document that was submitted to the Palestinian Authority claiming to be Israel's terms, which are being studied by teams from both sides in private. Some of those who saw the document told Al Jazeera that it offers the Palestinians less than what was offered to them in the unofficial Geneva Accords that was signed by Yossi Berlin, the leader of the Israeli Meretz Party, and Yasser Abed Rabbo, the Secretary General of the PLO Executive Committee. The document is six pages long and titled The Fundamental Issues Agreement. It reaffirms the nine memorandums of understanding that were reached by both sides since the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991. The objective is to achieve a historical reconciliation and the conflict and build the foundations for the negotiations for a final and permanent solution. The Israeli document calls for a two-state solution, one for the Jews and another one without a military for the Palestinians. It says that the borders between these two states will be based on the borders of June 4, 1967, in compliance with UN Resolutions 242 and 338. Israel will withdraw from what it calls significant areas and from settlements located outside these borders. The document guarantees that the future Palestinian state will have 6,250 square kilometers, which is the total area of both Gaza and the West Bank. The two will be linked with a corridor under Israeli control, but administered by the Palestinians. The Israeli proposed agreement of principles declares Jerusalem as the capital of religious sites and calls for mutual recognition of religious, historical and spiritual rights of the different groups living in it. But it says nothing about the issue of the Palestinian refugees' right of return nor the UN resolutions pertaining to them. Israel also proposes normalizing relations with all Arab countries according to the Arab Peace Initiative by establishing security and economic cooperation and diplomatic relations with them. Israel also proposes forming a multinational force to supervise the implementation of the agreement and protect it. The question remains, will this agreement be added to the list of previous declarations of principles? Or will it lay the foundation for the future negotiations of a final solution, despite the fact that it offers the Palestinians less. Walid al-Umari, Al-Jazeera, West Jerusalem.
الجزيرة القدس الغربية A short time ago, PA Chairman Mahmoud Abbas left the Prime Minister's residence in Jerusalem after holding talks with Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. For details, we go over to IBA's diplomatic correspondent in our Tel Aviv studio, Leah Zinder. Yes, hi, Laura. It's very interesting with all that going on in Sderot and in these long, hot days of summer with the Knesset in recess. There's a real sense of drama and optimism emanating from the Prime Minister's office today in the wake of the three hour meeting between Prime Minister Olmert and PA Chairman Abbas. According to senior diplomatic sources in Jerusalem, what was on the table at the meeting was a discussion of the core issues underlying the conflict the status of Jerusalem, the right of return for Palestinian refugees, as well as borders of a future Palestinian state. Now, this diplomatic activity will be stepped up in the weeks to come. U.S. Secretary of State Rice is expected here next month. Olmert and Abbas will meet again several times before October. Their goal is to reach an agreement of principles that can be presented at the November Peace Conference in Washington. Now, at the start of today's meeting, Abbas signed the guest book in the residence for the very first time with a wish for peace. Olmert thanked Abbas for yesterday's actions of the Palestinian security forces in rescuing the IDF officer who entered Geneva by mistake, there is a sense of real momentum, not only in the long term, but in the more immediate future as well. Olmert promised to dismantle some of the permanent roadblocks in the West Bank. He also said he would consider Abbas's request to release more Palestinian prisoners. And we're told in October, a joint Israeli-Palestinian Economic Council will be launched in Tel Aviv in the presence of Mahmoud Abbas and Quartet Peace Envoy Tony Blair. Thank you, Leah Zinder. A tragedy was averted in Janine yesterday when an IDF officer ignored security regulations and mistakenly entered the West Bank town. He narrowly escaped being lynched by a mob thanks to a swift intervention by Palestinian police. IBA's Eli Wagelanter has that story. This could have been a disaster. An IDF major en route to the northern West Bank accidentally entered Janine yesterday around noon. A Palestinian mob attacked his car, forcing him out of the vehicle and beating him. A Palestinian policeman who was passing by rushed to the officer's aid and managed to bring him safely to the Mukatta compound, which serves as the Palestinian Authority's security headquarters. From there, the police brought him to the roadblock at the city's northeastern entrance, where they handed him over to the IDF. We were very, very close to a lynching, said Palestinian Lieutenant Colonel Farah Satila. We have to remember that the officer was in the heart of a Palestinian city with a partially armed Palestinian mob around him. Minutes after the officer was taken, the crowd set fire to his car. Foreign Minister Tsipi Livni praised the Palestinian Authority for rescuing the officer. This operation proves that the Palestinian government and its forces are growing stronger in their action against the terrorist organizations, Livni said, during a meeting with Palestinian Prime Minister Salam Fayyad. Ironically, the IDF major is deputy safety officer at Central Command. This is a very embarrassing event, one officer said. We keep warning people not to enter those areas of the Palestinian Authority, only to have one of our officers, and not any officer, but a central command safety officer, violate every possible instruction and enter Janine. It was very lucky for us that the Palestinian police did the right thing. Military sources said that a disciplinary hearing would probably be held for the Israeli officer. Eli Wolgalanter, IBA News. تسلمت السلطة الوطنية قائمة جديدة بأسماء مقاومين وافقت إسرائيل على The Palestinian Authority received a new list of 110 resistance fighters that Israel had agreed to stop pursuing. General Akram Rajoub, the director of the Preventative Security Agency in Nablus, said that the list includes the names of 110 individuals, including 31 from Nablus. He said that the security agencies will notify the people whose names were included in the list, as was called for in four former agreements reached with Israel. Rajoub said that the Palestinian Authority will continue negotiating with Israel the issue of the pursued resistance fighters until it is completely resolved. Meanwhile, the occupation forces continue confiscating Palestinian lands in Al Waluj village in Bethlehem and Belain in Ramallah to make way for the apartheid wall. قرية الولجة 
Israeli military vehicles attacked Al Walaja village northwest of Bethlehem and uprooted hundreds of trees. There is an Israeli plan to isolate the Walja village by expanding the apartheid wall around it. The residents of the village held a demonstration to protest the confiscations of Palestinian lands and the construction of the wall. They held signs reading, Israeli policies are aimed at forcing the Palestinians to leave their homes and lands and expanding the settlements. The issue of the wall is the most recent problem in El Walaja village. We've suffered from many problems since the Israeli occupation in 1948. They're building a wall all around the village. The village will be linked to the West Bank through a tunnel. They've uprooted 1,800 trees to build this wall. These trees were very important to the village. The occupation forces attack the peaceful demonstration in Walaja village, injuring one Irish national and one of the village's residents. Foreign peace activists and local residents continue to hold demonstrations against the separation wall. This apartheid wall will eventually be removed because it was based on racist policies and it violates the Palestinian human rights. This wall prevents them from reaching their homes, jobs and schools. In addition, it makes it difficult for family members to visit each other. Israeli settlers have been carrying out systematic attacks against Palestinian citizens and their properties in Hebron. Abdul Hafiz al Jabari said that the settlers have threatened the stability of the city by their constant attacks against local residents. The settlers always create problems for us. If they want peace, why do they take our land? Where is the peace they are talking about? They have been making trouble for us from day one. They attack this person and kill that person. We can't even harvest the figs and olives from our fields. We can't stay on our lands. Every day they make trouble for us. I've built a home over there, but they destroyed it. They came at midnight to demolish my home. What kind of life is this? We want stability. What else can I say? Security is once again making headlines in Lebanon. The Lebanese forces heightened security after the ambassadors of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and several journalists received threats. The Lebanese government said that the threats were posted on the web and were corroborated by some who were detained and questioned in connection with the case. Once again, security has returned to the spotlight in Lebanon, where some Arab embassies received attack warnings. Several ambassadors from Arab and foreign countries, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, received attack warnings on their embassies in Lebanon. In a mysterious session that lasted more than five hours, the Lebanese government discussed this latest security development. Meanwhile, both the Saudi and the UAE ambassadors downplayed the incident. The UAE ambassador, Mohammed Sultan and Suwaidi said that the embassy will continue to conduct business as usual. In addition, the Saudi ambassador, Abdul Aziz Khoja, said that he'll return to Lebanon as soon as he wraps up a vacation in the kingdom. We've learned from history that our country has been under attack and unfortunately many people have been martyred. We must take these threats very seriously because those who were able to assassinate Lebanese officials in the past are able to target and kill more people. This latest threat did not have a major impact on the positive role played by the Saudis. Meanwhile, the Lebanese government took precautionary security measures in order to prevent new assassinations in the country. In addition, all political blocs, including the majority and the opposition, condemned these latest threats. Some Lebanese believe that this wide-range condemnation reflects positively on the political and humanitarian role played by Arab ambassadors in Lebanon. These threats were not only addressed to the Saudi and UAE ambassadors, but also included several Lebanese journalists and politicians. This news reminds the Lebanese of their painful past, which is still fresh in their memory. Alia Ibrahim, Dubai TV, Beirut.
The leaders of Sudan's Eastern Front have returned to Khartoum, ending 16 years of armed hostility against the central government. Their return comes in the context of the Eritrean-sponsored peace agreement signed last year between the Eastern Front and the Sudanese government. According to the agreement, both sides are to share power and formulate security measures aimed at incorporating fighters from the Eastern Front into the National Army. After 16 years of armed hostility against the central government in Khartoum, the leaders of Sudan's Eastern Front have returned home. This news comes as a result of the peace accord signed last October between the Eastern Front and Khartoum in the Eritrean capital, Asmara. The returnees received a warm welcome in Khartoum, where the central government stressed the importance of implementing the articles of the Asmara peace agreement. This peace agreement is the first step towards resolving the outstanding issues in eastern Sudan. The Eastern Front, which consists of several political organizations and entities, expressed relief over the warm welcome given to its leaders in Khartoum. Meanwhile, some Eastern Front leaders expressed doubt that the government will take serious measures to implement the articles of the peace agreement. We returned with good intention and we hope that the peace will prevail in the entire region. With this, we declare that all hostilities have ended in eastern Sudan. Three prominent leaders from the Eastern Front, including Musa Muhammad Ahmad, who was appointed as an assistant to Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir, will take the oath to join the government. In addition, the deputy chairwoman for the Eastern Front, Dr. Anna Dirar, was appointed as al-Bashir's advisor. Meanwhile, the head of the Free Lion organization, Mubarak Salim, was appointed as a cabinet minister. Khartoum said that the participation of the Eastern Front leaders in the government is an important step towards the implementation of the peace agreement and ending what used to be known as the years of political marginalization against Sudanese Eastern rebels. After we were sworn in before our brothers in the Legislative Council, we will hold the first meeting of the High Commission. We do not have time to waste, and we must work hard and continue to follow up in order to reach positive results. The return of the exiled Eastern Front leaders may give a political advantage to both sides of the Asmara peace agreement. However, the Eastern Front may face a political showdown in the government, especially in light of the growing internal division inside its leadership. This news comes after the deputy chief of the Beja Conference Party withdrew from the Eastern Front and accused its leaders of adopting a tribal method of power sharing. The return of the Eastern Front leaders and their participation in the National Unity Government in Khartoum has closed the last chapter of the war in Eastern Sudan. Meanwhile, the Sudanese hope that this news will also help close another chapter of war in the western region of Darfur. For Al Madar program, Usama Abbas, Abu Dhabi Channel, Khartoum. The security conditions in Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, continue to deteriorate. There are escalated tensions amidst explosions and daily violence, despite the holding of a national reconciliation conference aimed at resolving the country's successive crises, which threaten the political and peace processes simultaneously. Mohammed Juri has the details. Mogadishu is a city that sleeps and awakens to the sounds of explosions and the scenes of killing and violence amidst ongoing confrontations between the Ethiopian-backed interim government and armed opposition groups. Armed opposition groups have now included on their list of targets the markets, the main streets, and the hotels. These groups had previously focused on targeting police stations and Ethiopian forces' positions. Somalia's problem is similar to many of the problems that are facing the Islamic world. The victims are always civilians who have done nothing wrong. 
The Luff Wayne and Medina hotels host many senior officials of the interim government and some delegations that are participating in the National Reconciliation Conference. These hotels also have become targets of the latest missile and bomb attacks. Thus, the circle of violence has widened, threatening efforts to continue the National Reconciliation Conference, which began in the middle of last month between the Somali tribes. Despite the fact that not all Somali groups, including the opposition, are participating, the conference is aimed at getting the country out of its excessive crises. We are getting killed and displaced. We hope that the conference comes out with positive results that will lead us to national reconciliation. Some agreements have been made at this conference about ending the conflict, putting down weapons and surrendering them to the government, as well as returning property. These agreements are not new, since the same agreements were made at previous conferences. However, the agreements remained merely ink on paper. People are anticipating the results of this conference, which may be a peaceful start to a continued political process that can lead to security. Attacks by armed groups, which were usually carried out under the dark cover of night, are today being carried out in the clear light of day. Meanwhile, the theater of violence, which used to take place in areas where armed groups operated, has now expanded to areas which previously enjoyed greater safety. This indicates that the interim government and its Ethiopian ally have not yet been able to enforce security in the Somali capital. Mohamed Jari, Al Arabiya, Mogadishu. Elavir Abdullah Gul has won a resounding victory in the Turkish presidential election. Turkey's foreign minister was elected president less than an hour ago. A controversial candidate, Gul's background in political Islam has provoked stern words from the Turkish military who worry he'll undermine the republic's secular principles. Let's go live now to the capital, Ankara, and our correspondent Barnaby Phillips. Barnaby. <laughs> Thank you. Parliament is abuzz with the historic events of the past couple of hours. As you say, Mr. Gul has been elected Turkey's 11th president, and it was a resounding victory, 339 votes. He sailed over the 50 percent that he needed. He wasn't in the chamber to hear the news because he has left to prepare for the official swearing-in ceremony, which will happen back here in the parliament in the next couple of hours. So Mr. Gul will be returning to parliament effectively as Turkey's next president. Well, let me introduce my guest at this stage. His name is Murat Murchan. He is a good friend of Mr. Gul's. He's also an AK Party member of parliament. Uh, Mr. Murchan, it can't have escaped your attention that this vote was boycotted by the largest opposition party again. Does that mean that Mr. Gul is going to struggle to be a consensus president for all the people of Turkey? I don't think so, because uh, two of the opposition parties, in fact, three of the opposition parties have participated into the voting procedure. Uh, the main opposition party, uh, which is represented by about 990 seats, le less than 100 seats, they decided not to come to the parliament and, and not to vote for uh, the presidential election. It's, of course, their choice, but I know that Mr. Gül, uh, as he had stated very clearly in his uh, speeches, Mr. Gül is going to represent all people in Turkey. I don't think that it will last long. The opposition's position, main opposition's position toward Mr. Gül is going to last more because we had seen a similar uh, attitude in the past when Mr. Özal had been elected as a president. One of the opposition parties have vetoed have boycotted him. So with his but, but with all respect, it's not just here in Parliament that there's the opposition. There was that quite extraordinary statement from the, from the military last night, perhaps more significant. Clearly, the army does not want Mr. Gul to be Turkey's president. Look, the army has always made statements before the 30th of August, because 30th of August is our uh, salvation. Uh, festivities. Well, this that statement very, came early, and it was very strong. No, in fact, if you look at if you look at the previous statements by, by the by the chief of staff, once he made the statement on the 29th, two years ago, uh, the chief of staff then made the statement on the 26th. Uh, that very much depends on 
which day the the week starts and whether there is the takeover okay but the, the content of the statement talking about centers of evil the secular state being corroded you know what that means that is an attack on your party and mr gould uh i don't think so i don't think so i, I i'd rather i'd rather uh, take the statement in general which everyone agrees in 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 many way for instance secularism and uh, unite unified country are all uh, are the fundamental principles of this country which we all abide by and which we all seek for but i don't think uh, this will create a problem in the in the coming days and institutions also in this country uh, get their mandate from the constitution and constitution is the guiding principle for all institutions including the president of course but this is uncharted territory isn't it after all we now have a first lady mrs gull who wears a headscarf is she going to be invisible are we not going to see her at main ceremonies mr gull both mr gull and Ms. mrs gull president gull and president gull Hayr Nusra Gül are very sens sensible people. They really know uh, the concerns and realities of this country, and I don't think that uh, tension will come up from from their acts. They they will act very reasonably, very sensibly. But uh, to answer my question, is she going to stay away, for example, from something like Victory Day celebrations in two days' time? Maybe the army don't even want her there. I'm not. I'm not Ms. Mrs. Gül, so I can't answer your question. Uh, all I can say that uh, uh, the president and his wife will not uh, will not be the source of tension in this country. In fact, we, they will dampen the potential so-called pseudo tensions. Murat celebrating the election of President Gul. He corrected me there, and we're expecting the swearing-in ceremony here in Parliament uh, sometime in the next hour, hour and a half. Hi, I'm Sandeep Roy. I've been a journalist and radio host for New America Media and a commentator on National Public Radio for more than five years and written for mainstream and ethnic media for more than 10. And I can tell you, it's tough out there for journalists these days, especially for journalists, scholars and filmmakers dedicated to bringing ignored voices and ideas into the public forum. There are just fewer and fewer outlets. One rare survivor is Mosaic, world news from the Middle East. It gives me the news about the Middle East through its own lens. It's no accident that there is no show like Mosaic on any other channel. A program like Mosaic that takes a truly unflinching look at US foreign policy and the Middle East could only be made possible in a completely uncensored forum like Link TV. That makes it a precious resource and an endangered one. The foundation support that funded Mosaic for the last six years has ended so I'm asking you to come through for Mosaic right now. Please call the number on your screen now and make that donation for Mosaic. Anything from $50 to $500 will help keep Mosaic on the air and you informed. I want to thank those of you who made that call. Because of you, Link TV and Mosaic are getting closer to their $200,000 goal. But there's a long way to go. The number's right there on your screen, so call now and make that donation or go online at linktv.org and click on the support button. As a journalist, I know firsthand how rare this kind of channel is. Please call the number on your screen and keep Mosaic alive. Once it's gone, it will not find a home on mainstream media. Call the number on your screen right now or donate online at linktv.org. Give whatever you can to keep one bastion of free press on the air. Thank you. Mosaic needs your support. Help us reach our goal to raise $200,000 by the end of the year to keep Mosaic on the air. Pledge your gift today at 1-866-485-8848 or linktv.org. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic, 
is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.